Well, I, I can tell you, when I look back over my life, I've been extremely blessed and I've had great people come and help me along the way. And I'm going to show you uh, in a moment here, a fundamental person in my life actually gave me a job 30 years ago and uh, set me on a career of wreckage and ruin and horror and all kinds of things like that. But I uh, was glad to know he is still there. He has always remained a friend and uh, I am so pleased to have him tonight. John Dadicus, the New York chair of the private client group of the firm of Holland and Knight. Uh, a list of honors as long as your arm. Three times he's been in the New York Times, three times Chambers Awards, top 100 attorneys of Worth Magazine, 2005, 2007, a whole bunch of other stuff that if I kept reading it, I'd never get to interview John. But I am so pleased to have John here tonight by Skype. And John, how are you, my friend? Tony, great to, to hear you and hear your voice and see you again. Uh, uh... You, you make my head swell. Hopefully it doesn't, it's not as large as the camera. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, one of the best things of being in this show is being able to call on people who actually know something. John and I have talked through the years, and one of the things uh, with the new presidential administration is, at least me, uh, working in the field, I don't know which end is up. And I just said to John about a month ago, we need to get you on, John, because we need to hear from someone who actually knows this stuff and knows which way uh, this may happen. I'm so tired of listening to pundits and pinheads that uh, my head's starting to swell. But a little bit of background about John. Uh, John is from Harrison, New York. I met him years back in the firm of Revis and McGrath. And John, did you always want to be a lawyer? Uh, yeah, Tony. I, I started out in high school, um, and interestingly, I went to Johns Hopkins. Uh, probably got in because I was a pre-med and wanted to be a lawyer. So, yeah, uh, way back when, uh, I the law practice. Boy, that's that, that's great. I'm I'm still confused <laughs> what I wanted to, as you know. But um, there's lots of stuff happening in Washington right now. Uh, you know, the Secretary of the Treasury, Stephen Mnuchin, came out with his one-page uh, tax plan, uh, which was, quote-unquote, well, later to be talking points. Where do we go? What do we do, says Scarlett O'Hara? What are the prospects of a state tax repeal or any significant tax change in your estimation? Well, it's interesting, Tony. You know, everybody's uh, talking about it, and clearly with the way Congress is and what's happening, and I haven't listened to the latest, I think, Tomorrow is the big day when uh, uh, former FBI Comey uh, gets on the. Uh, Believe it's Thursday, but, but it's close. Yes. I, but I think at the end of the day, what we're going to see is that uh, um, if there is any movement on the state tax repeal, it will be like we did the last time, uh, a limited time period, and then we're back to square one. Let me say this too that. When I started practicing law in 1976, the federal estate tax rate was 77%. And add to it, each state had its own estate tax. Maybe there were a few back then that didn't, like Florida, but places like Connecticut, New York, New Jersey had it. And they added another 5%. So at the top level, you were paying 82% estate tax. That's come down over the years, but it's still a significant sum of money. People argue that the it doesn't really generate a lot of revenue for the uh, government, but there's also the psychological and the uh, idea that we can pass way, way too much down to um, non-deserving children, grandchildren, and so therefore there's the entire idea that the estate tax is here to stay. It's, it's a fascinating thing. Like I know my own state, we started with an inheritance tax years ago, and then the farmers revolted because uh, sitting there on land that was worth you know, hundreds of thousands, if not you know, maybe a couple of million dollars, and someone dies and boom, bang, there goes the farm. And uh, that all kind of went away, and now we have a modified form. It, it, it's just the ball keeps bouncing, but you hit on that thing of... Uh, you know, quote unquote, the social justice aspect about the undeserving heirs, and uh, I, uh, I, I, I found that quite interesting. Now, if there were a federal estate tax repeal, 
uh, a lot of the stuff that you read out there is we don't have to plan for anything because the tax man's not coming after us. What's your thought on that? Well, my thought is now you got the devil to deal with, and that is what are we going to do with these assets, and clearly how do we make sure that children, grandchildren, and future generations can enjoy what people have made in their lifetime. Uh, it's very interesting because when I started in this business, as I said in 76, maybe you'd create a trust and you'd say, okay, we'll make a distribution outright to the grandchildren and the children. And now, and we don't also make trust for income to be paid out on an annual basis. Well, fast forward to today, and we really talk about the idea of trying to protect assets. And, and really, it's much more important to figure out how these assets are going to be administered and that's a, that's a very difficult topic for many clients. It's easy to talk about the estate tax. That's a number cruncher. But to talk about who's going to handle the money and how to do it, uh, very interesting. Uh, to me, when I looked at it, um, and you may recollect even when you, you and I worked together back in the 90s, that uh, um, I was an advocate that trusteeships needed to be sort of bifurcated amongst various roles, administrative, mm -hmm. investment management, distribution, and maybe even a, a, a new role that we talked about, trustee advisor, who just organizes the other three roles. Um, very important that the right people play uh, a part in those roles because you want to make sure that the um, investment management, the, really the funds, the, the legacy that people have worked hard for during their life, I mean, talk about farms and, and, and the like, how do they pass it down to generations? So um, there's a lot of work still to be done there in making sure that uh, both uh, surviving spouses and children and, and, and the like are taken care of. And that's an excellent point. Now, um, if, if we're setting up a trust, um, you know this and I know this and I still get a lot of mileage out of it and uh, the uh, state of New York there's still that law on the books that uh, a trustee can't be a habitual user of alcohol which of course would disqualify maybe 50 to 75 percent of all the people we ever knew but all of that said and, and, and uh, my feeble attempts at humor aside what are the qualities of a good trustee should a trustee be a family member? Should it be a private trustee? Should it be a bank? Or is it different strokes for different folks? Well, I, I would say clearly it's uh, different strokes for different folks. I mean, uh, and, and why I say that, at certain levels, the economics may not work uh, uh, to have so many people involved. But as you know, in what you've devoted uh, um, much of your career since uh, gone off on your own, is how to handle the fiduciary duties that, that are so important and how to bring in people. Um, I think you recognize the idea that investment management today is a very unique subset of a fiduciary world, but understanding the fiduciary role of what it is and oversighting and being able to even uh, fire an investment manager who's not performing right is very important. The flip side is how to organize distributions. I mean, they, they, the new trusts that I'm drafting today are clearly designed to make distributions for the, the, the beneficiary's best interest. How do we define that? How do we make sure that that's being taken care of? You can't just sit there and at the end of the year say, oh, let's just give them the income. You need to examine what the, uh, uh, the, the creator of the trust wanted what the individuals want, and what the remainder uh, uh, would handle it. Does it just go for college education? Maybe we save it until people are in retirement years. Um, Interesting. These are various aspects that need qualified individuals, such as yourself with your company, to handle on the other side. I do believe family has a, a, an important role, especially um, making certain decisions for family members uh, uh, who are younger, so the senior generation can make yeah, uh, uh, decisions. The flip is, does the sibling want to be involved with another sibling's family? That becomes dicey too, and, and you know, 
It's all about family and we trust. So eventually, if there is a member that's going to maybe create problems, whether they, as you mentioned, alcohol and, 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 and the like, I mean, we're recognizing the issues of addiction, how do we help? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we go on for probably an hour on whether it should be an incentive trust or a, a, a medical trust it is a is one of those a special needs type person. So various various aspects and it really takes professionals like you and me to help oh, clients fine. understand all those issues. I you know, and, and I did want to raise this. It seems that there's a new at least to me, a new school of thought. I mean, you know, I started back in the days of the uh, the leather chairs and the uh, cigar chomping atheist type uh, you know uh, investment banks working as trustees and it kind of here's your distribution kid shut up get out of my hair now it seems that there's this whole whatever you want to call a genre of being sensitive to the needs of the beneficiary and I've even seen people going as far as to give seminars where it's your mind and your mindset and the beneficiary's mindset and that money and, and bereavement and all of that is a much more of a psychological and emotional experience than perhaps we may have ever given credit to way back when. Have you run into that? How do you feel about it? And uh, what might be your perspective? Well, yeah, I totally agree. I think it is somewhat psychological. Um, I do believe that there is a very important and Jay Hughes, who's a, a friend of mine, wrote about this, and that is the idea that a trustee needs to be a mentor for the family. You talk about the old style trustee where um, at the end of the year, he'd sit there and uh, the family would gather and say, okay, here's your check of income. Um, that's gone by the wayside. I think it's a much more active role and, and you can see it in, in certain families who have really taken on the idea that this is no different than a family business. Um, you know, mm -hmm. that I created the Attorneys for Family Held Enterprises, and it's a very um, unique area because of the multidisciplinary issues that come up for family businesses. Well, I think a, a, a well-reasoned, well-thought-out trust and, and uh, concept is no different. We see a lot of the development of family offices today, and, and uh, that's just an outgrowth of family businesses too. So there is a lot of psychological issues, and 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 the need to help people understand what wealth is. Um, I've talked about wealth uh, uh, now many years, and I believe that wealth is not just financial assets, but it's human assets and it's societal assets. You talk about the nonprofit. Uh, 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 advertisements that you, you have, I mean, clearly uh, people need to understand that there is a role of uh, uh, charity involved in all of these uh, endeavors, and, and there's a legacy to be left that involves charity. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's an amazing thing. It's multifaceted, and as the wise old man said, money does make the world go round. I, I don't want to let you go without talking about will contests. You know, you were noted for dealing with the Hugo Clark estate, uh, the reclusive her heiress. And it was, even though people watching you might say, oh, why, you know, I don't have millions of dollars, but yet they might have some substantial assets and they might be involved in a, a will contest and the uh, degradation of a family. Let's talk about that, your role, how it happens, and really how we can avoid it. Perhaps maybe talking ourselves out of a job, but you know, please go ahead. <laughs> well, well, let me tell you, I mean, for those, for those listeners and, and viewers who don't know who Jay Hughes was a recluse of 20 years. Her father was uh, a robber that baron. Um, he was a copper baron um, and had uh, was deemed to be at some point in time maybe wealthier than John D. Rockefeller. And um, she was uh, born of a second marriage um, uh, and there was a great, great deal of um, uh, excuse me, I Apologize. Great deal of uh, difference in age between the two uh, um, uh, 
the mother of Huguette and the father. He died in 1925, and she lived till 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, she ended up, and he had uh, uh, five siblings when he died, or she had five siblings when she died. Um, all of that wealth is now uh, uh, past and, and beyond uh, the wealth of uh, uh, an individual, um, and it's all dissipated. You look at the Rockefeller family, and we still see what it is. And I always point to my clients, and I say to my clients, if you really want to know how wealth should be transferred, go down to the Rockefeller Center um, ice rink and see what John D. Rockefeller said. And he has a statement of purpose. And I think that's so important to clients to understand that there is something that I want people to recognize, some, something that I want to people to understand about this. So um, clearly wealth has that to it. To get back to your question of avoiding probate contests, um, that one was unique because the, 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 the um, heirs at law uh, had not even seen her for some almost 50 years. Uh, wow. And, and so therefore, it was clearly a, a situation where she had no real close relatives. They were all um, uh, half uh, grand nieces and grand nephews and half great grand nieces and grand nephews. Um, and yet, because the laws say that if you're a person who doesn't have a will, those people would take if you don't have a will. Mm-hmm. Clearly, in, in order to avoid probate contests, it's not just giving to those people, but it's, it's understanding that you do need professionals to assist you and walk you through uh, the issues that one uh, would, would face. And, and uh, the, the litigation that goes on in will contests are clearly um, that person isn't here, so it's, it makes it even more difficult. You can't dig them up and ask them. Yeah. Now, you know, you hit on something there that was in, that really was interesting. and. Um, When people choose professionals, obviously there are matters requiring higher degrees of skill based upon different things. Uh, Bigger is not necessarily more difficult, but yet typically it tends to run that way. Family dynamics get in. What should someone do in choosing? You know, what are some good benchmarks in choosing the proper attorney, bank, accountant, trust administrator, financial advisor. Can you give us some good rules to live by? Sure. I mean, I think that uh, clearly you, 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 well, let's start. And, you know, we, we know that there is legal Zoom, and legal Zoom has, uh, uh, advertises all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not going to get anything that, that is worthwhile. I've even looked at the legal Zoom documents and the instructions, and I can tell you that you are at high risk, any, any person is at high risk if you follow even their form to, to uh, write a will. If you're going beyond that, clearly you want somebody who's been in this business for a while, and it also depends on your own asset structure and, and the extent of that asset structure. Mm-hmm. So uh, clearly, um, you know, people think, well, I, I should get a will when I started there was always this idea well give away the will and, and get the estate administration oh, I remember that <laughs> you, know, you can't get it you, you get what you pay for and you know if there are a lot of economics it, it doesn't behoove you to look for the uh, least expensive provider um, I do believe that the real key is finding somebody you trust and finding somebody who is willing to always be there, and finding somebody, a, a lawyer, a, a, a trustee who has a succession plan themselves so that they understand that if I got hit by the bus in my group, there are other people who right away know what I've been working on and can assist our clients in moving on. Um, and, uh, they, that, that, that somewhat takes away a solo practitioner, but Clearly, you want to make sure that 
solo practitioner will be there because this is could be something that uh, uh, if I write a will for a 60 year old, that person may live to be 90 years old, and I'll be not in my 90s at the same time. It's yeah, it it, it it's it, and this is the thing. It's. Uh, it, it, it is not a one size fits all, and I, you know, and I thank you for saying that and making that clear. Uh, in our closing moments together, and I know you run into them and I run into them. There's a lot of them whom um, I, I I've had the pleasure of working for. People who were dual citizens, people who were thinking of uh, leaving the country based upon, uh, like we talked earlier today about someone who left due to health care, or one of my guys who left, uh, went back to Canada. And uh, what are some of the considerations that they should do rather than packing up and moving? Keep your citizenship, expatriate, um, just some of the bumpers that you, you want to impress upon people. You know, and that's fascinating because I know when I go to uh, Palm Springs, California, uh, I sit in a hot tub with a whole bunch of grumbling Canadians who are complaining about their dollar only being worth 70 cents. But this is where they all come. And, it's, uh, and, and they own condominiums and things like that, and they probably didn't give it a bit of thought. Isn't that unbelievable? Last question I'm going to ask you. Uh, your prediction, which is as good as anybody's, I'm sure better than mine, certainly can't hold you to it. What do you see happening with Trump health care and uh, what may uh, will go down to 2018? Uh, is he going to make it? Is he not going to make it? I mean, I have no idea. Um, 
it's, uh, you know, as Maynard G. Krebs said, what an age we live in. Uh, John, thank you so much for being here. Where can our friends and fans and people seeing this reach you? And uh, I suggest they do. And uh, you, uh, you have my, uh, my recommendation, if not my urging, to go see John. John, you tell us. Sure. Just, uh, you know, you, you, the law firm is Holland and Knight. The website is uh, hklaw.com. That's hklaw.com. Uh, and if you're, if, if you're really ambitious, my email address is john.dakis at hklaw.com. Terrific. John, thanks so much. We'll be talking soon. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Tony. Good to see you again. And you too. Good night. And that was John Dadicus. So glad to have him. We're going to be coming right back real quick with the nonprofit announcements. You guys don't go away. After that, Michael Dante, right here on Tony D'Angelo's Being Coast to Coast. Profit announcements. Once again, I would like to let you know about the blood drive in Milford, Connecticut. And I'm going to read this and I'm not going to mess it up. The first annual mega drive by the Connecticut Epilepsy Advocate. The Connecticut Epilepsy Advocate and the American Red Cross are proud to announce the date of our 16th blood drive, which is our first annual mega drive. Our goal is to have 200 people donate the gift of life in eight and one half hours. It will take place on Monday, July 3rd, 2017 at St. Agnes Church, 400 Merwin Avenue, Milford, Connecticut, 10 o'clock a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Please remember with Rapid Pass, you can use the online health history system the day you donate. Again, our goal is to have 200 people to donate the gift of life in eight and one half hours. As always, we know a few of you cannot donate, so please ask all you know who can. There is a grave need for blood in the state of Connecticut. Blood is needed more than before, especially in the summer months. So if you're willing to come down and wait to donate without time constraints, please do. To schedule your appointment for this or any other blood drive in Connecticut, please call the Red Cross at 800-733-2767 or go online www.redcrossblood.org slash give slash drive Drive search list JZP. You'll see the rest of it. See my pal Bobby Fiore, Michael Dante coming up right after this. Meet Al. And my time was running wild in the Indian streets And every time I thought I got it made It seemed the taste was not so sweet So I turned myself to face me But I've never caught a glimpse How the others must see the faker I'm much too fast to 
take that test and Never leave the stream of warm and permanent sand. So the days float through my eyes, but still the days seem the same. And these children that you spit on as they try to change their worlds are immune to your consultations. They're quite aware of what they're going through. Changes. Turn and face the strange. Changes. Don't tell them to blow up on all of it. That time may change me.